Hello there, welcome to the latest edition of the Front Page, the Racing Post news analysis programme. Last week we started with a blockbuster story with news of Kevin Stott's departure from Ammo Racing. We've got a biggie as well this week to start the programme, namely the doping scandal that has rocked Irish racing. We'll also be looking back on a fascinating St Ledger and St Ledger Day and looking at the British 2024 fixture list. When is it going to appear and what does the delay mean for the sport's radical premierisation plan? My name is Lee Mottisett. I am joined here in the studio by Maddie Playle and at home by our island editor Richard Forrestal. Um, all well, Richie? Can't complain, Lee. Thanks very much. Uh, Maddie, any complaints? No complaints. Really enjoyed the St Ledger, so looking forward to talking about that in just a minute. Perfect. We start the show then with no complaints and with an exciting Members Club offer. Are you ready to take your passion for horse racing to the next level? With Racing Post Members Club, you gain exclusive access to the best racing insights, analysis and tools. Immerse yourself in award-winning content from interviews with the sport's biggest stars to race previews and behind-the-scenes features. Get the inside track with early access to the Racing Post digital newspaper from 9pm in the evening and daily selections from our expert tipsters. Racing Post Members Club is your ultimate ticket to the thrilling world of racing. Subscribe today and pay just £9.99 per month for the first two months with the code SUMMER. See the link in the video description for more information. Terms apply. Right then, we are going to crack on with the biggest story of last week. It occurred in Ireland and Richie, you have all the details. Yeah, uh, as you kind of outlined already, Lee, fairly scandalous uh, development from an Irish racing point of view. Luke Comer, um, who many will know in the kind of broader world as a very successful property developer along with his brother Brian. Um, he holds a license to train. His yard is in Kiltiernan in, in County Dublin and we learned last week that 12 of his horses had tested positive for methandionone and methyltestosterone, uh, try and get those pronunciations correct, which are anabolic steroids. Um, the first one arose out of a, a, a race um, at Leopardstown. He knows no fear. The horse finished fourth the same day and a hair sample that was taken that day subsequently threw up these substances and uh, an out of competition IHRB uh, raid, if you like, on the yard subsequently um, they took a dozen or they took a, a lot of samples that day, not a dozen, but a dozen came back positive, including he knows no fear again. So, um, you know, it, it's it's been when you look at the, the background um, to this over the last number of years and, and allegations made by uh, Jim Bulger, for example, who has stated on the record that he doesn't feel Irish racing uh, is a level playing field and that people were doing things they shouldn't be. Um, and you put this into the mix, it, it doesn't look great. Um, it makes for very uncomfortable viewing from an Irish racing point of view. Um, there are kind of curiosities about it all that don't seem to add up. Um, you know, it's very hard to reconcile some of the findings with uh, the coma results, if you like. Um, but either way, you know, anabolic steroids or anabolic steroids, they shouldn't be in any system. They're prohibited at all times. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is it, it looks desperate um, and, and it's, it's sad to see it emerge. We don't know. It, the, the IHRB never established how it got in the horse's system. They were unable to prove that they were deliberately administered at any point. Um, Luke Comer denies that they were deliberately, deliberately administered at any point. Um, but they're there um, and they were there. So, you know, it, as, as we say, it looks bad. Richie, bear in mind um, the, the scale of the, um, the doping at play here, but contrasting that with the fact that Luke Comer um, has insisted that he believes he has done nothing wrong himself. What's your take on the, the scale of punishment dished out to Mr Comer? Yeah, very tricky question, um, Lee, because I suppose, you know, in terms of a precedent, we don't have one of this scale. The closest you could say we have was the Philip Fenton case from some years back when Philip got a three-year disqualification, not a suspension of a li his license, a three-year disqualification when he was found in possession of steroids. Um, so this is a three-year suspension of uh, Mr. Comer's license. Um, 
with no kind of you know liability accepted if you like in terms of administering the substances um i don't know it's you know, there are so many strands to this. Obviously, strict liability is a topic that's going to come up again now. Um, we saw Simona Halep over the weekend emerge, you know, a superstar in the tennis world, um, emerge with uh, an, a steroids in her system. She denies it strenuously, yet she has got a three-year ban, um, and that's an outright ban. You know, she's not going to be involved in the sport. Um, Luke Comer, as we all know, will likely, um, if, if the ban uh, stays and if if he is unsuccessful in an appeal, I believe he's going to appeal it. But if he were to be unsuccessful, you know his suspension, he he would be able to then have someone else in place in the yard to run the yard and keep it as a going concern. So that in itself is is kind of it's unsatisfactory when you're talking about substances of this nature. Um, there are there are many elements to, that emerge from this case that I would say. Um, need to be teased out a bit over the next period of time because you have here a trainer who as i understand it isn't tax resident in ireland his he, he i believe i believe he, he lives in monaco he used to live in monaco in a luke homer and he admitted in the trial the other day that he's only in the uh, in the country for three months of the year um so how how then he can oversee an operation of this nature um properly is hard to see because his assistant jim gorman also revealed in the hearing that he is only on site until one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so in terms of the supervision, and it was a point made by the IHRB that it wasn't up to scratch. You know, when you when you have a yard and you're a licensed trainer, you need to be able to stand over everything that goes on in the yard and everything that's administered to the horses. Um, and I don't see how Luke Comer or his assistant Jim Gorman could do that when they're not there um, 24-7, as it were. Obviously, no trainer is going to be on site 24-7, but they have structures in place where you had you would have responsible um, responsible personnel in, in lieu, if you like. So, look, we'll see if he appeals, Lee, um, and we'll see what comes of that. Um, but in terms of the suspension... You know, you go back five years, um, I think, and we had the IHRB telling us that any horse testing positive for uh, prohibited at all times substances would be receiving lifetime bans. Um, and that, again, hasn't happened in this instance. The horses have been banned for two years um, and that's it. You know, and the other side of it, of course, and to put that case across, like, is that there was no evidence found of administering these substances. And if you look at the horses that tested positive, 10 of the 12, I don't think they ever won for, for Luke Comer. Um, one of them won that year. He knows no fear, did win that year. And I think Blyton won that year. So two, two of them won that year of the 12. So in terms of results, it's hard to reconcile that these horses were receiving um, performance-enhancing substances, which is what clearly was in their system, um, because the results don't bear that out. Um, the, the flip side of that is if you want to look at the timeline, um, you know, the, the, as I said, there's an, an awful lot of angles to pursue here. But if you look at the timeline, Luke Comer had very few winners for a number of years, uh, no winners in many years. And then from 21, 22, 23, um, you know, there has been a significant improvement in, in, in his return. So that would be another way of looking at it. Um, but it's just a very kind of grey case where it's disappointing again that no... Um, no kind of concrete um, explanation has been found. And it's not the first time we've had this issue um, with, with IHRB investigations or BHA investigations for that matter. Um, but there comes a point and, you know, it was it was what we saw in the tennis. If it's in the system and you can't explain it, then there nearly has to be an assumption of guilt. Thanks, Richie. Back with you in, in a second. Maddie, loads of interesting points to pick up um, from what Richie was saying there. The thing in some ways that I found most jaw-dropping about um, this doping story wasn't even necessarily the doping itself. It was this revelation that the license holder, not only was he um, uh, not necessarily in the yard um, for nine months of the year, he wasn't even in the country. Yeah. It seems perplexing that... Um, a regulator can regulate someone to train horses who for nine months of the year isn't in Ireland. And I guess why, you know, he's not accepting responsibility and he's claiming that he doesn't know how this happened, he's investigating it and spent a lot of money doing so, Luke Comer. Um, ultimately, he is licensed and he has to take um, a portion of responsibility because 
that is his role, you know, and um, whether it's happened, you know, as he says, he doesn't know how, um, it's his responsibility to, to figure out how it has happened and, and ensure that it doesn't, and it has. Um, so, as Richie said, it's a very confusing case. Um, I don't think it looks very good from, from a regulatory perspective. You know, in this environment, we're talking about um, Jim Bulger's comments, you know, recent um, breaches for, for welfare or for drugs or what have you. Um, we need to have trust in the IHRB that they can, they can deal with these issues swiftly, effectively. And this is clearly very complex, but in an ideal world, you want to have that confidence in them to do that. And this doesn't exactly fill you with it. On that point then um, that Maddie makes, Richie, the IHR, IHRB in, in the last few years has been a, a battered organisation really. Its, its reputation has been uh, knocked, it's been criticised um, on a number of fronts and in a number of different places um, and it still has important questions to answer on, 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 in different cases. Has what's happened here helped to bolster and improve the regulator's reputation? Um, to a point, I think it has, Lee, because, um, look, I'd have been as critical of the IHRB and, and its predecessors, the Turf Club, as anyone, and you can argue the point here about the sanction um, and whether it's appropriate or not, and I'll go back to the Simona Halep incident. You know, if it's, if there's a substance identified in your system that shouldn't be in there under any circumstances and you can't explain why it's there, then there has to be an, some sort of an assumption of guilt. Um, so that the, the sanction is another point, but in terms of the case as a whole, um, it's not that long ago where we weren't able to detect anabolic steroids in Irish racing. As far as I'm concerned, we weren't in it. There, there was none of them historically thrown up. Um, and then about five years ago, we changed labs. The, the regulator changed labs to LGC in Newmarket. And ever since, there has been a handful. Um, we had Turbine in 2019. Dennis Hogan trained horse. David Dunn trained Jump Sora. He was disqualified from a Ballon Row bumper. Um, and this is another incident of anabolic steroids being thrown up and subsequently the case being prosecuted. Um, I suppose the other, the other thing to say about it is we're talking here about a major sponsor. Um, a major sponsor in Irish racing, the Comer Group, um, at, head, at the headquarters of Irish racing, which is where the IHRB have their headquarters themselves. Um, so they're effectively um, tenants of the Curra. The Curra are, are associated with Luke Comer's Comer Group from a sponsorship point of view. So for them then to be seen to pursue the case, um, to have it heard publicly, if you like, and, 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 and have the case published, um, and for Luke Comer to be sanctioned in the way that he has with a three-year suspension with, um, you know, 80-odd 80 thousand 80 euros in fines and, and three-quarters of a million in, in costs. You know, as the, Dara Lachlan, the IHRB CEO, said the other day, they're doing it without fear or favour. You would like to think that they are, um, and, and I, would, I would take some positives. We don't want to see anabolic steroids emerging in Irish racing. But I would take some positives from the fact that, number one, we can test for them now and they are being thrown up in samples. And number two, that the cases are clearly being tra uh, transparently prosecuted. So in that respect, I would say there is some positives. Richie, and if um, Luke Comer's licence, he, he is suspended, how do you think it's going to reflect if, if another trainer is, is sort of parachuted in to, to take care of the operation? Obviously, this is a u unique scenario because not only does he train these horses, but he owns them too. Yeah. Uh, again, another tricky question. Um, I, in cases like this, like there, there are examples um, in Britain and Ireland where this has happened, and there are cases where you would say, okay, fair enough. You know, the license might be suspended for six months or, or a year, and you know it mightn't be for something quite as egregious as this. But if you're dealing with anabolic steroids, um, I think you have to be you. Ha you have to make a statement, and you have to shut the yard down. You know the the the, the defence uh, uh, about keeping it open and having someone else in there is that the horses need to be cared for. You don't want to punish the owners and all that. The owners can send the horses somewhere else, um, and 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 the horse. You know, it's not good enough to say that the horses need to be cared for. They can be they can be sent to different yards. And um, there are other ways of dealing with it. If you're talking about um, anabolic steroids and having adequate deterrence. Um, I think you have to be shutting down those yards. I really do. Richard, just, just finally, um, 
we, we, we know that horse racing survives on, on public support, and that's not just in terms of the welfare of horses, but in the integrity of the sport itself. Um, Jim Bulger has been referenced on this programme already. He was referenced in the coverage, and back in 2020, he spoke about um, the difficulties of not competing in what he believed to be uh, a, a, le a playing field that wasn't level, and that drugs in the sport were, in his opinion, the number one issue for Irish racing. We heard um, last few days, Darrell Lachlan, the IHB chief executive, talking about his, his belief that Irish racing is basically a clean sport, saying all the evidence points to it not being an issue, all the evidence points to it being a level playing field. Within Irish racing, is there a general belief that Darrow Lachlan's position is correct or that Jim Bolger is correct and that there are still things that are set to be unearthed and uncovered? I would think the consensus, whether we're all very naive or not, is that Darrow Lachlan's position is probably a bit closer to the truth. Um, William Mullins and Aidan O'Brien uh, and people like that are the, the standard bearers in the industry and their horses are tested all over the world all the time. Um, you know, there is no suggestion of anything untoward about their operations. Um, I think there is most likely um, illicit doping going on in racing, um, but I would think it's more than likely going to be the people who are trying to catch up um, with some of these bigger operations. I don't believe there is a systemic problem with uh, doping in Irish racing. Um, and I'd, I'd wonder if, if um, this is the kind of thing even that, that Jim Bulger was referring to. I'm not sure. He, he made it very, his comments at the time were very vague. Um, but over the last number of years, since, we, since the IHRB changed lab to LGC in Newmarket, I would have a lot more confidence that, confidence that things are being picked up that maybe previously wasn't the case. And we saw that with a spike at the time when the labs changed. There was a spike in positives, an alarming spike. And that has, over the last couple of years, tapered off um, again. So, uh, you know, you can see with the success that the Irish Yards have internationally um, how people wonder, you know, is it all above board? Um, but I do think that at the moment, those powerful yards are just in a very good place, same as we've seen with various British and other yards over the years. When they get into a rhythm, they, get, they have good horses, they have good staff, they're managing to maintain it. They're attracting good owners all the time um, and they're able to maintain it. And I don't think that there is a systemic uh, doping problem in Irish racing. And I think the fact that we have these positives emerging is effectively proving as much. Thanks, Richie. Well, um, no train and no yard represents Ireland on the international racing scene with more success than Aidan O'Brien and Bally Doll. And they were again uh, on top at Doncaster on Saturday when Continuous won the Betfred St. Ledger. Maddie, what would you take on the day? I thought it was a wonderful day, Lee. Obviously, there was so many threads to this year's St. Ledger. You had the King and Queen's horse, Desert Hero, uh, my fancy in the race in there, and then Frankie de Tory riding in his final classic aboard Arrest, who he switched from uh, quite last minute after initially being promised to Gregory. Um, seventh St. Ledger for Aidan O'Brien, third St. Ledger for Ryan Moore. We know that they're just absolute masters of their craft at this stage and Continuous is an improving horse. This was a performance that was up to scratch with recent renewals, a racing post rating of 121 puts it there. Um, interestingly, he doesn't have an arc entry. He needs to be supplemented. Um, it sounds like that's the way that Connections want to go. He's a 10 to 1 chance to do so. Um, all of Aidan O'Brien's recent St Ledger winners have run in the arc. Not with success, but they've run well. Um, but for me, one of the most interesting things about this horse is his background. Um, we talk about how Japanese racing is becoming a world leader in breeding and racing. Um, and this was another strike for, for them in one way, because the sire, Hearts Cry, uh, had continuous um, out of fluff who was a half-sister to Maybe, who of course was responsible for Saxon Warrior. So again, this is proof of Coolmore Ballydoyle delving into Japanese bloodlines. Um, 
apparently because Deep Impact wasn't available at the time. That's why they went to Hearts Cry. Well, from a very small pool of mares, uh, in this case, perhaps even one, he's certainly unearthed an absolute superstar. I was really taken with the horse's demeanour before the race. We saw, and I'm sure you'll tell us in a moment, about the king and the queen in the parade ring. Um, incredible energy about the place, and he just never really turned a hair. Again, as were a few of the runners, he was quite keen in the early stages, enthusiastic if you like. Ryan Moore went for that bold run up the inside rail um, and he just seems to have a really powerful turn of foot and as much as he's stayed the one mile six furlong trip, he seems to have decent speed about him. So I don't think stepping back to a mile and a half will be an issue. You would think, given that he's a St. Ledger winner now, um, although he has you know, that pre de jockey club form to overturn with ace impact, you think he'd stay in training next year, which is really exciting, and um, potentially not even for the cup races. He could be a, a really top class mile and a half prospect. For me, he's improving, and that's one of the most exciting things about him because I think there's even more to come. Hearts Christ progeny do tend to stay well and they do tend to improve with age. Um, so this was just another another master stroke from all involved, really. And good to see the right horses fill the places in behind. It, it looked like it rode a, a good race that we could rely on from a form perspective. Yes, indeed. Um... Richie, how taken were you with the um, the horse and the race in general? Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, it was a good race, another good performance, um, another serious uh, call that Aidan O'Brien is after producing. We know he's got Augusta Rodan and and um, Paddington already has three year old uh, serious three year old colts. He's got the kind of the range of middle distances covered by the looks of it with this fella. Um, and uh, you know, interesting the way. You know they they have all kind of um, improved in in different respects. We know how Paddington progressed. Augusta Rodan has obviously been up and down during his year, but he, he Aidan O'Brien managed to keep bringing him back. And this horse similarly, like I mean, he was a real slow burner. He was well beaten um, by the Foxes in in um, the Dante, I think it was at York, um, and then he disappointed in France, as Maddie said, um, and he was beaten by King of Steel at Ascot, um, and he has progressed to win at York and, and to win uh, ultimately the Ledger at um, at uh, Doncaster on Saturday. And I think it just, I mean, uh, I've long been a Moore fan. Um, there was a period, I suppose, a few years ago when I, I thought he maybe wasn't at the absolute zenith of his powers like he had been. Um, but over the past two, three years again, I just think he has been an absolute um, sensation to watch. You know, the, the confidence and the conviction he rides with um, these days is a sight to behold. And in a race that I suspect wasn't the most straightforward race to ride because I don't think they went that fast. Um, and he had to be very decisive and, and, and go and seize the race when he did. And, and, you know, he did it in spectacular fashion again. Like, I just think watching him ride at the moment... Um, is is brilliant he, you know he's he's the best in the world for me um and there haven't been many better in the history of the game and he's just at the absolute peak of his powers at the moment so it's great to see um and and great to see him do it on you know he, he's got the caliber of horse that's doing him justice if you like at the moment from from Bally Doyle. Do you know what I find interesting Richie and that's how Ryan Moore you know he has this reputation of not being great with the press but he seems to be really engaging at the moment why why do you think that is he seems to be a lot lighter and a lot happier to, to talk things through and, and less of the Ryan Moore of old. And it's great to see because he's a great communicator when he wants to be. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't have had a lot to do with him a good few years ago. It's only in recent years since he's become more regularly more a regular visitor in, um, in Ireland that I've kind of encountered him a little bit. And I must say, I've always found it very good to deal with. Um, you know, but I can see what I can see the point you're making. Like, I mean, he, his interviews have been kind of more flowing and, and more generous um, and he maybe hasn't been as abrupt as, as he might have been perceived before. Um, I guess they're just in a very happy place as a, as a team at the moment, and that might have a lot to do with it. You know, um, you know, it's it's there is kind of there's no kind of grey area in terms of who's the number one these days. Obviously, Donica was there for a while, and you know there was a bit of kind of second guessing as to who might be on the best horse on a given day or where either of them would be going that might be kind of deemed the number one um, concern on a given day as it were but you know I think the fact that he has um, Aidan's complete faith at the moment uh, and vice versa they just both have complete faith in each other I think they're, they're both in a very good place um, and you can see that in, in the results. Richie it's really interesting sort of subject this so 
talking about Ryan Moore now riding um, at the very height of his powers, but you were saying that maybe two, three years ago, he wasn't quite riding it at this level. As someone who, who's ridden yourself competitively and professionally, could you see things then two, three years ago in Ryan's riding that you're not seeing now? C can you explain what you think has changed? I just, it's, it's come down to conviction ultimately, you know, um, and riding with, with true conviction. And it's not something that's easy to explain, I suppose. It's, it, it, it's, it's something that comes from confidence um, and just belief in yourself. And when you transfer that into conviction in the saddle, like, you know, it's, you don't make any wrong decisions, basically, you know, or very, you make the absolute minimum, minimum wrong decisions when you're riding with that conviction. And he, he has just struck me. And it's not that he was riding bad a few years ago. Um, I just never thought, I just thought there was a spell, I should say, where I didn't think he was riding with his usual conviction. Um, we're going back probably four or five years at this stage, um, Lee, you know what I mean? I mean, he's been, for the last number of years now, he has been at the absolute peak of his powers again. Um, and maybe there is a natural kind of um, arc there, if you like, as a professional. Like, he, he came onto the scene and his graph would have been fairly fairly steady uh, upward. Um, and there's probably a bit of a plateau for any sports person and when they get there is trying to maintain the level of performance that got them there in the first place and keep doing the things you were doing that got you there when you're in a slightly different place in terms of expectation. Um, maybe that is the kind of thing that feeds into it. And then you kind of learn to live with that expectation. You learn to cope with it and you learn to ride um, without kind of paying any heed to it, if you like. Um, and over the past three or four years, certainly, his confidence levels, as far as I'm concerned, and they're watching him, have soared. And that translates, the, con the, con the confidence translates to conviction. And if you watch him, now there is a certainty about what he's doing. Um, you know, he, he, he just always seems to be in the right place. He always seems to have every situation covered. Um, and I just think it's, it's, you know, it's nice to see it. Um, you know, we're talking about world-class riders. Frankie in his pomp would have done it. Um, Mick Canan, for me, is the greatest flat jockey that ever walked the earth. In my lifetime, I should, I should, I should qualify that a little bit. I know people will argue about Leicester, um, but that would have been before, before my time. I would have seen Leicester, obviously, but you know, he would have okay. been in his pump, yeah, um, yeah, prior to to me getting into the game. But so Canaan is the standard bearer for me, and at the moment, Moore is in that zone. He's, as far as I'm concerned, the best in the world at the moment. He makes the fewest mistakes, and he makes fewer mistakes still when it matters most on the biggest days and that's how you judge these riders the ones who make the fewest mistakes when it matters most it's really interesting as well the 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 extent to which uh coolmore have ryan moore on a pedestal is highlighted by the fact that this week they're flying him to sydney to ride shinzo the chris waller train called him he won the the golden slipper uh, back in april he's riding him in a group one at caulfield on Saturday, and Maddie in a yeah. seamless link. And, He's gone, Richie. Sorry, go on. Well, just just briefly on that, like Lee, um, I don't have the stats in front of me, <clears throat> so it's not something I've looked at. But seeing as you're talking about it, like I mean, his his tenure with O'Brien now far exceeds um, any of his predecessors by yeah. some way. Like Canaan, Murta, Fallon, any of these guys, um, his 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 association and and the rewards they have yielded together in terms of Group One wins and in terms of longevity. Um, like I don't think, and and it's famous last words, of course. But I don't think, <laughs> I I don't think there has has been a time where where any of those predecessors enjoyed such a prolonged yeah. um, period of synchronicity, if you like, where they, they both sides were kind of very clearly and evidently happy with the situation, as Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien have been for the last number of years. There was always, you know. Um, Previously, Aidan could get tetchy, I suppose, and, and you know there was the move from from Canaan to Murta and, and, and so on, uh, or uh, um, to Fallon and, and, and Murta and so on. So there was, and then you had Joseph in there as well. Obviously, Joseph was brilliant while he was there, but it didn't last very long because of his weight. Donica was in there, but when you look at their tenure together over the last number of years. It far exceeds, as I say, I don't have the stats in front of me, but in terms of the longevity of it and the number of Group 1 winners they have um, combined for together, it far exceeds any of those predecessors. And they were, uh, as we know, illustrious predecessors. Yeah, excellent points. Um, Ryan Moore's off to Australia. 
Desert Hero, the Ledger Third, might be off to Australia. He's yeah. owned by the King, and to complete my seamless link here, I thought that the King and Queen, just briefly, were one of the, the, the big stories of the day on Saturday. There was a tremendous mood and vibe around uh, Doncaster. If you rewind back to last year's St. Ledger, uh, the late Queen had just died. Um, on Ledger Day, it was that stage of the day late in a very somber mood. God Save the King was sung on a racehorse the first time uh, since the reign of King George VI. And I think at that point, there were real fears within racing, and there had been through the final years of the Queen's life, as to what happens next, given her importance as a patron of the sport. But we saw he went to all four days, all five days, sorry, of uh, Royal Ascot with the Queen. And I think the fact that he went to Doncaster on Saturday, the fact they both went to Doncaster on Saturday, was a great sign in itself. But he seemed remarkably relaxed. I was in, in the paddock when he was there with the Queen before the race. He looked to be really enjoying himself. He went on a walkabout. The crowd responded very well to them both. I think that's a significant thing for the sport going forward. Would you agree? Absolutely. And as you say, it wasn't so long ago that we were sort of worrying what would happen with, with those royal links and the sport. Um, people just engage with it, don't they? When you have big public figures um, showing their support for racing, that can only ever be a good thing. And particularly, you know, in this sort of scenario, in in a classic and, you know, it was almost full full circle, wasn't it? I'm sure the Queen... Uh, the late Queen would have loved to see uh, Desert Hero and he did run a really bold race for them. So that's yeah. fantastic and great that they're going to be ambitious with their campaigning and uh, thinking of possibly going to Australia. Indeed, some of the other runners in the, in the St. Ledger could as well. But yeah, great, great to see, great to see them engaging with the public. And um, it, it seemed even through the TV screens like it was a fantastic atmosphere at Doncaster on Saturday. Yeah, it really was. And well done to all at Doncaster and the Arc team. They did a great job last year in difficult circumstances. And I thought they did a great job again this year. The King is loving his racing, whether he's quite uh, covering every detail of the 2024 British fixture list and when it might appear, I don't quite know. But we did learn a bit more about that last week. And that brings us to our third story, the fixture list. And where is premierisation right now? Premierisation, uh, as a brief pricey, is the plan for British racing in 2024, one that represents uh, the BHA, race courses and racing's participants. It's an attempt to showcase, better showcase, the, the top tier of the sport. Around 160 meetings in 2024 are set to be premier meetings. And part of the, the plan around those meetings is that they will offer more money than they have up to now. That money will come in part from increased race course investment. It will come controversially from a reallocation of, of funds from the grassroots of the sport to the top tier. Uh, they reckon that's about two million pounds of redistributed funds, according to one race course manager who represents a course at the bottom end of the sport or the grassroots end of the sport. But also needed is additional money from, if you like, racing's Piggy bank, the levy board, and there was a key levy board board meeting on Thursday at which the levy board was asked to consider a proposal, a recommendation from British Racing to pump an additional three million pounds into the premierisation plan, if you like, into those top tier races. The levy board had already stated going into that meeting that it wouldn't just waive anything through. It's a statutory body. In effect, it's dealing with quasi-public money. It has to be very careful in how it spends it. And at that meeting on Thursday, the Levy Board didn't agree to the plan put forward by British Racing, but also it didn't throw that plan out. We heard from Chief Executive Alan Del Monte that there will be further uh, discussions over the next week or two prior to another Levy Board meeting at which the Levy Board uh, board will consider updated information from the sport. And if that then uh, produces agreement, we could expect the fixture list to be produced quite soon. So that remains ongoing. And around that whole debate of, of fixtures and whose stage is what, there was another story last week that relates to, to Fakenham, um, the, 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 the relatively small but incredibly popular uh, jump strike in its community, which has in, for the last 15 years staged a meeting on New Year's Day. It's become its uh, most valuable fixture and its joint best attended fixture. But it will not stage that meeting 
in 2024. It's a BHA owned fixture as opposed to a Fakin and Racecourse owned fixture. And um, the ARC owned Southall has in effect outbid Fakenham for that meeting, which has not gone down well with Fakenham. And they will stage that meeting now the following day on January 2nd. So Maddie, um, we still don't yet know the precise details of the premiorisation plan because we don't know yet that the money is there to pay for the premiorisation plan and therefore we still don't know the 2024 fixture list. Now there always seems to, to be a delay to any fixture list presentation but for this one the reasons are specific and different to previous years. Um, how do you see this whole story at the moment? Yeah, a pr the premiorisation as a concept seems to have developed and, and taken in a few directions since it was initially mooted. Um, and I think first off, it's, it's a good thing that the fixture list has been delayed because we need to be sure that this strategy, if you like, is, is going to be effective and, and is going to be um, adopted in, in, a, in a position where it could work. Um, it's worth saying that the fixture list is is pretty much one of racing's, you know, one of the most powerful things in racing if we want to inflict, inflict change is to do it through the fixture list. Although, as you mentioned, a lot of those fixtures aren't owned by the BHA. No, the majority um, are owned by race courses. Yeah, the majority are owned by race courses. I think for me, there is a general consensus of racing is not in a great position at the moment when it comes to, you know, field sizes, turnover, affordability checks, etc. Um, prize money, of course, ongoing issues. And therefore, overall, from, from looking at the sport from the outside, it, it is clear that there needs to be um, maybe some short-term uh, pain for long-term gain. Um, but obviously, that's going to be an incredibly difficult thing when you're talking about smaller race courses who may suffer and, and lose a, a key portion of their income um, to this premiorisation um, strategy. So. For me, I think we need to make sure that we know how this is going to play out. We know where the money is going to be coming from and we can project what improvements this is going to have um, before we, we get carried away with it. I, I don't necessarily think it's going to solve all of racing's woes, um, but we're in a very difficult position where there's probably not any one thing that we can do that is magically going to, to sort out those issues. So I think it's a good thing that you know, more time is being taken to, to sort out these issues with the fixture list. Um, but ultimately, you know, we need a, a, a culling of fixtures, I think, in order to fix a fundamental problem. And whether we're going to get that is unlikely. Um, that's not to say that some changes that can be made can can be helpful and, and you know, take another step forward onto, onto improving racing as a product. Do you have sympathy with the position that's been, forward, been put forward by racecourses towards the grassroots end of the sport, that they are going to lose out through um, this agenda. Um, not least because, as has been discussed before, the bulk of Premier fixtures will take place on Saturdays. There will be a 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. protected window in which only two Premier fixtures plus one other fixture can take place within that window, meaning tracks that would otherwise have raced on a Saturday afternoon have to take place before 2 p.m. or more likely from 4 p.m. onwards, although you obviously couldn't do that in the winter. Um, a lot of race courses, race course bookmakers, and crucially race goers, um, fear that they are set to suffer as a result of this. And in some ways, although the Fakenham story wasn't linked to premiorisation, it's a case of the BHA and well, the commercial committee and then the BHA board uh, selling and handing across a, the BHA fixture to, a, to the highest bidder. But Fakenham's position would be that a small country jumps track has lost out at the hands of a big racecourse group. And part of the whole premiorisation debate is will the big just get bigger and bigger and those at the grassroots lose out. Do you have sympathy for Fakenham and racecourses like that in, in that in that perspective? I absolutely I have sympathy. You know, um, we've spoken about this on the show before. You know, these smaller racecourses mean a hell of a lot to their to their communities. And that's the thing with racing. It's so multifaceted and people are pulling in so many different directions. If you change one small thing, the knock on effects are actually going to implicate lots of different people. Um, I do have sympathy for them. But at the same time, I think racing is really 
um, you know, needs to be careful and needs to secure its future and, and action needs to be taken to do that. Whether premiumization is the right way to do it, I'm not sure, um, but I do think it's going to be nigh on impossible to have a solution that doesn't impinge on some people somewhere. Richie, um, watching this one from Ireland, is your view that the pain that might be felt towards the bottom end of the sport worth it for the uh, the growth that might be experienced towards the top end of the sport? Um, yeah, look, I, I'm almost inclined to plead the fifth on this one, uh, <laughs> Lee, because I, I haven't studied it in detail, um, but a lot of what Maddie is saying makes sense. If there is loads of money being thrown at this concept um, and it's going to impinge on the smaller tracks, then they will have to find ways to compensate them. Um, you know, if, if, if we're looking at the industry as a whole, you can't just leave them to 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 squander, um, you know, at the, you know, just to, to promote these um, big Saturday fixtures in the way that they're talking about. Um, I suspect, and, and I have had, you know, very little um, insight into this. You know, I, I'm not intimately familiar with the goings on behind the scenes and so on. But as long as the tracks own the fixtures, and as long as there is this sort of resistance there, um, I think they're probably going to find it quite hard to to get where they want to be anytime soon um, or, you know, to implement the strategy they want to implement. So, you know, we're into September now um, and Maddie is right. You know, you want to take the time to get it done. But they also, you know, it's tight enough window that they've got now. If they want to do this right, they want to be able to publish it, publicize it and so on in, in a fairly timely fashion. Um, we're into the autumn now. We don't know what the plans are for 2024. Um, I don't know, as I say, what's going on behind the scenes, but is it a million to one that this thing could be kicked on another bit and maybe not, not implemented next year? I suspect it might be a possibility, but um, you'll have a better idea than me, I suspect, Lee. Well, I, th I think it's certainly right that the, the levy board um, is taking a very prudent approach to this. Um, this, in effect, isn't racing's money just to, 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 to grab when it wants, and there's no suggestion that racing believes it is, um, but I think it's right that the levy board is extremely careful in how it allocates public money um, in effect. And of course, there is, Maddie, a sense in which, in terms of the premiorisation plan, that British racing has gone out and, if you like, um, tried to buy a glorious new house. Um, but three months out, it's not really sure how to pay for it. Yeah, um, and I guess that just sums up really the position that, that racing and the, and the BHA are in when they're trying to make these changes and make these improvements. We know that there's a new structure in place there now and this premiorisation is going to be key to how that operates, whether it can get it off the ground and as Richie said, in time or not. Um, I think the jury is still out on, the, on this concept as a whole and the fact that this fixture list has been delayed sort of shows that, that there's a lack of, of information available, that there's a lack of of confidence behind it, um, but equally, I, I sympathise. You know, it's it's the the idea and the concept does have positives, um, but we need to know a little bit more about them and how that's going to look in practice and how the smaller tracks, in particular, and the grassroots are going to be impacted. Yeah, based on what Liverpool Chief Executive Alan Delmonte said, this updated information will be key. Of course, we don't know at this stage what that information will be. OK, that then are our three stories completed. Before we wrap up the show, I have exciting news for you in relation to free bets. OK, time then to decide who this week's winning front page story will be. Um, I have been talking about premiorisation and the fixture list and we will continue talking about premiorisation and the fixture list and therefore we'll leave that one for another week. Maddie, um, you presented a great case for the St Ledger and I say I think it was a great St Ledger and a great St Ledger day. So great work from you. But Richie, Doping scandal has to win. Uh, congratulations. It's like a fairly dubious honour, Lee, but thanks very much. Yeah, well, we, we've got to take all wins where we can get them. 
Um, thanks then to, to Richie and thanks to Maddie. Thanks to you for watching the front page. We'll be back again next Monday. Until then, bye-bye.